Well, good morning. Good to see you here today. Uh, yesterday, my wife said to me, come on, let's, uh, let's go change the clocks. And uh, this is that time of year when I'm reminded of how many clocks you have in your house. <laughs> I'm sure my parents didn't have as many clocks as we do. They're all over the place. Thankfully, some of them self-adjust, which is good. Well, today is kind of uh, one of those messages that is part one and part two, and I'm going to bring part one, and then next Sunday, Jared is going to bring part two. So you let us know if you feel like it sounded like part one and part two. They're not two different stories. They're actually uh, connected, the great escape. How would you describe what's happening in Ukraine these days? Journalists around the world are describing it with a biblical term. You may have noticed. You may have recognized it in the headlines. Let me share a few of them with you. Mass exodus from Ukraine continues. Global news. Inside the exodus, YouTube. The Ukrainian exodus at the Polish border, the New Yorker. This one's a little longer. In just a week, Ukraine refugee exodus exceeds 1 million CTV news. Of course, it's now gone beyond 2 million. Ukraine exodus grows as West Mull's oil embargo, the EU observer. Well, you spotted the word, right? Right? E-X-O-D-U-S, Exodus. Would you believe that there's even a travel agency called Exodus Travel, and their tagline is, where adventure holidays begin? So maybe next time uh, you go on a holiday, you might want to get some help from them. Well, the Exodus story in the Bible is big, and I mean big. It dominates. Although it's featured in the book of Exodus, you will also find it referred to in Genesis Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, Isaiah, Micah, Psalms, and the New Testament. It's just about everywhere in the Bible. If you don't know your Exodus story, then you just don't know your Bible. Sometimes you will find it in narrative form, like Exodus 14, and at other times it's expressed more poetically, like Psalm 106 or Exodus 15. Uh, I don't know that we're actually going to have a sermon on Exodus 15, but it's an entire song. It's a, it's a poem, and it's all about, well, you know, the horse and the rider, and we've sung songs like that over the years. What these have in common, oh, the other thing I wanted to add, it is in narrative form, and it is expressed poetically, but it is also presented, according to some commentators, like a series of news bulletins or notes. And so we're going to use that as a framework for our talk today. And what they all have in common is that they refer to history, or what I like to call holy history, because this is history that reveals God to the reader. The title, of course, The Great Escape, and it's based on Exodus 12. 31 to 42. So there are several notes, shall we say, Exodus notes. There is a note about Israel's exit orders. There is a note about their departure. There is a note about some travel logistics. Some of you are administrative types. You will appreciate that note because if you were organizing this band, you would need some of that information. And last but not least, there is a note to inspire us. It's a note about God's goodness. Well, let's begin with the note on their exit orders in verses 31 to 33. I'm reading from the NIV 11. We're going to learn what it was that they were told to do, as well as who told them to do it. Beginning at verse 31. During the night, Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, Up, leave my people, you and the Israelites. Go worship the Lord as you have requested. Take your flocks and herds as you have said and go. And also bless me. 
The Egyptians urged the people to hurry and leave the country, for otherwise they said, we will die. Well, first there are some official exit orders in 31 and 32, and you've, I'm sure, noticed the commands as I was reading. Get up. Leave my people. Go. Worship the Lord. Take your flocks. Go. Just go. You get the idea? Pharaoh would not be happy until he saw the children of Israel in his rearview mirror. Well, back in Exodus 6, it's interesting that the Lord had said the time would come when Pharaoh would drive them out of his country. And now that time had come. And did you catch Pharaoh's unusual, unexpected request? Out of the blue, he asks for a blessing. What's that about? Verse 32. Well, I think we should give it some context, okay? We should recall that Pharaoh would have been feeling especially vulnerable by now. His country is reeling. They had just been through a series of extreme events, events that have destabilized Egypt, ruined their economy, led to the deaths of their firstborn, and eroded confidence in their gods. It's like God had Pharaoh by the throat. He felt vulnerable. And so he pleads with Moses and Aaron to advocate for them. Pharaoh's a desperate man. Well, desperate is good when it comes to saying your prayers. You may have noticed. I think God gets better mileage out of the prayers of desperate people. Prayed any desperate prayers lately for yourself? For your kids? Your country? How about the Ukraine? Can you appreciate the logic of Pharaoh's predicament? If you found yourself in serious trouble, wouldn't it make sense to appeal to God for his blessing? And not because you deserve it. Oh, no. Because you need it. So these were the official exit orders. And then there were some interesting unofficial orders. Verse 33. Not only did Pharaoh show uh, Israel the door, but so did the general population. The Egyptians were smart enough to know that not only was death knocking on their door, it had come in. The firstborns were proof of that. Unless they could rid the land of the Israelites, their God may lay further away. So their immediate thought was, Israel, be gone. These exit orders represented a significant change of heart. A significant change of heart. Some of God's most impressive work is the work of bending the human will. It's an awesome thing when a person who is dead set against God experiences a change of mind. Think Saul of Tarsus, C.S. Lewis, Chuck Colson, you. The summer of 1970 was pretty important for me because when I started the summer, I did not want to be a Christian. And when I got to the end of the summer, I was a Christian. Something happened between the beginning and the end of that summer. My will was bent toward God. How does that happen? I don't know. I just know that it does happen, and I've witnessed it in the lives of many people. That's the kind of work that God does. So that's the note about the exit orders. Next is a note on Israel's departure, verses 34 and 36. This is where we learn what it was they left with. Exodus 12, 34. Let's begin reading there. So the people took their dough before the yeast was added and carried it on their shoulders in kneading troughs wrapped in clothing. The Israelites did as Moses instructed and asked the Egyptians for articles of silver and gold and for clothing. The Lord had made the Egyptians favorably disposed towards the people and they gave them what they asked for. So they plundered the Egyptians. I wonder if Moses saw any humor in this. I don't know that, you know, when I think of Moses, that I think of him as a particularly jovial guy, but I'm seeing a little bit of humor in here because verse 34, first of all, is about Israel leaving with their dough, right? 
Israel left Egypt with their bread dough, but in the next couple of verses, we see Israel leaving with Egypt's dough. You get that, dough? (laughs) They're leaving with their resources, right? The Israelites asked the Egyptians to fund their trip to the promised land. Seriously, they asked them for their precious metals and clothing. Is this a case of crowdfunding or what? It says the the Israelites were able to plunder the Egyptians. Why? How? How does that work? The Bible doesn't really tell us. It just reports it. Here's an interesting... um, We'll get to that in a moment. Um, What do you call it when God transforms people into being ultra generous towards their slaves. Isn't that what's going on here? These were their slaves, the people that worked for them hard, day in and day out, and now they're giving them their resources. It looks to me like another case of will bending. Here's an interesting observation from an Old Testament specialist, Bruce Wells. He writes, These events are set in the spring when it was customary for Egyptian kings to send out messengers to collect tribute payments. So it was, it was tax time. Spring was tax collecting time. In a sense then, springtime was the time the Egyptian officials plundered their subject peoples. And once again, the biblical text turns the tables on an Egyptian custom. This time, the Egyptians are the ones exploited and forced to pay. That would be like doing a drive-by, our prime minister's home, and, you know, bringing your candy bag and leaving with a bunch of money. But it doesn't usually work that way. It's the opposite, isn't it? Well, how's that for sovereignty? Israel's God is, again, showing himself to be in charge. God supplies his people's needs, and he does it with a touch of humor. Perhaps that's happened in your life as well. When I was in seminary for four years, I was poor as a church mouse. I mean, we were, our bank account was always hovering somewhere between zero and about $100, and we're living in a foreign land, and uh, we have one child. And so that could be a little scary at times. And yet God has a sense of humor. Uh, We would often do house sitting. People in Dallas like to go on holidays, and so they would invite reputable people like seminary students to stay in their homes. And I remember the first family where we did house sitting, a massive house, couple of children that they left behind, nice cars that we got to drive, and they had a maid. And yet, I'm the guy who's got a bank balance that's hovering between zero and $100. I just, I just thought it was ridiculous and humorous, and yet at the same time, we were so thankful that God was providing for us in this way. Well, don't we wish God would show up in power more often? Like yourself, I would like God to flex his muscles in the war on Ukraine to make the Russians favorably disposed towards the Ukrainian people, to make Putin content with the land he already possesses and not feeling like he has to go and take more just because he wants it or because he can. Is it okay to pray with God's sovereignty in mind? I think so. I think so. I think it would be a righteous thing these days to ask God to thwart bullies like Putin any way that he wants to. Maybe not the way that you would want to, but any way that God chooses to thwart him, go for it, God. We will applaud your work. And if you don't think that's righteous, I would encourage you to read through the book of Psalms sometime and to listen carefully to some of the prayers of King David. God had been messing with Pharaoh throughout the ten plagues, hardening his heart, softening his heart, showing the world who is really in charge. Okay, so we've had a note about their exit orders, what they were told to do. We've had a note about their departure, who's really in charge. And now we have a note about some logistics, verses 37 to 39. Um, Now, by logistics, you could mean a lot of things, but what the author has in mind here are their compass heading, their composition as a group, as well as their provisions. Well, let's begin reading at verse 37. 
The Israelites journeyed from Ramses to Succoth. There were about 600,000 men on foot, besides women and children. Many other people went up with them, and also large droves of livestock, both flocks and herds. With the dough, we're back to the dough, with the dough the Israelites had brought from Egypt, they baked loaves of unleavened bread. So first of all, they're heading. Verses 30, uh, the beginning of verse 37. Their first leg was from a place called Ramses. I don't know, has anybody ever been to Egypt? Uh, Well, there used to be a place called Ramses, but we don't know where it is anymore. The Bible simply tells us that there was a place called Succoth, Ramses, and then they traveled on to a place called Succoth. We don't know where it is, but likely it was in an easterly direction. So they had an easterly bearing. And then their makeup. I find this really interesting. 37 to 38. The author tells us that there were 600,000 what? Men, foot soldiers. Depending on uh, uh, plus, so 600,000 soldiers, plus dependents. Okay? These are guys who are married. They've got wives. They've got children, dependents as well, and it says there were others, other conquered peoples, maybe people noticed the buses were leaving for the promised land, and they thought, you know what, we're going with Israel, this looks like a good time to leave, and so there were uh, other peoples as well, and depending on how you do the math, it is not difficult at all to get uh, up to numbers of between two and three million people. So that's a lot of people, a lot of people. Plus, there were herds of animals. Can you imagine if you were part of this entourage, what you would hear? Wish the Bible had an audio track. What you could see? How about what you could smell? You'd have to be careful where you put your sandal when you took the next step, right? A lot of animals there. So it's a giant-sized company, and I would think that it's a real logistical nightmare. And then thirdly, their provisions, verse 39. They'd, needed, they'd need something to eat, and for now they'd have to survive on a simple diet of unleavened bread, which I'm sure at first sounded pretty good. It's like that big box of granola bars we bought at uh, uh, Costco. The first two-thirds were really delicious. And then that last third, it just seems to sit there forever. And I'm wondering if it was like that with unleavened bread. It seemed really good at first. Well, the more we learn about the logistics of the Exodus, the more overwhelmed we become. I mean, if we're honest, if you put yourself in charge of the people who had to administer all of this, it is just mind-boggling. Uh, whoa, millions of people and whatnot. So it just gets more and more overwhelming, and this is only the beginning of their trek, which makes me think not so much about the logistics of the Exodus, but about the logistics of our lives. Does it ever seem to you like there's more need than there are resources? I have often felt like that in my work as a pastor. Someone comes to us, and their needs exceed our resources, even as a church. And so I pray, uh, who is sufficient for these things? And I'm reminded our sufficiency is of God. God is able to do the unthinkable, the impossible. It's like God delights in taking on big projects. I mean, the first first story in the Bible is the story of what? It's the first big project that God got involved with, creation. And then, of course, there was the exodus. And then there's this, you know, little project called redemption. And then there's the whole business of finishing up in us what he has started. Big, big work. Big projects that God gets involved in. And these are things that overwhelm us. And these things that overwhelm us are things that God is able to accomplish. Like what? What are the things in your life that overwhelm you? Do you know any prodigal sons or daughters? That's enough to overwhelm a parent. Or 
what about God helping us to endure a difficult job? Or maybe just a next door neighbor. Um, what about God being able to see us to the end of life and then through death and out the other side and into the life to come? He is able, the Bible tells us. He is able to handle and to manage all of these things. And then here uh, we find ourselves in a pandemic and we're not done yet. We'd like to be done, but we're not quite done yet. There's the war in the Ukraine and then you go to fill up your vehicle with gas or to you know, fill up your grocery cart at Superstore uh, and everything seems to be going in one direction. Uh, yesterday I, I went and I was going to buy some uh, Winkler Farmer sausage and I, I hope I misread the price because it's, uh, it's right up there. If I was a, a pig farmer, I think I'd be feeling pretty good these days. Prices are, are looking good for the pig farmer. Um, you ever feel stretched? Does this ever make you feel anxious? Maybe just a bit? Do you ever feel like throwing up your hands and saying, I quit, get me out of here? Well, that's when it's good to know that God can see us through the overwhelming stuff of life. And we've had many examples of that over the past couple of years right here at Belmore. And there's a final note, and this is my favorite note. This is the one that gives you hope. It's a note on the goodness of God, verses 40 to 42. Let me read that to you. Now the length of time the Israelite people lived in Egypt was 430 years. At the end of the 430 years, to the very day, all the Lord's divisions left Egypt. Because the Lord kept vigil that night to bring them out of Egypt, on this night all the Israelites are to keep vigil to honor the Lord for the generations to come. This note highlights some of the proofs of the goodness of God. And he starts with maybe our all-time favorite, the faithfulness of God, 40 and 41. And the author draws our attention way back to Genesis 15 to an ancient prophecy. You know, you don't have to go to the prophetical books to read prophecy. You find prophecy throughout the Bible, and Genesis 15 is one of them. And there the Lord had told Abraham that his descendants would sojourn in a foreign country, that would be Egypt, for a long time, over four centuries, and that they would eventually escape, that would be the Exodus. And it is that prophecy that is being fulfilled right now in the passage that we're reading. So in other words, and I know you've heard this, you've heard this a million times, and because our forgetteries are better than our memories, I have to remind you of it over and over again. And I need to be reminded of it. The Lord is faithful. What he promises he will do, you can bank on the promises of God. Come back next week and I'll tell you that again, because you may have forgotten it. What promises are you counting on today? I think I have told you about the plaque in my parents' home as I was growwing up. I never meant to memorize it, but you know, you walk by it umpteen times a day and after a while it starts to sink in. And the plaque said, the future is as bright as the promises of God. I used to think that was just silly. And now I hang on to it for dear life. The future is as bright as the promises of God. I like that. I can use that. And the other point of inspiration, the first is the faithfulness of God. In verse 42, the second one is his care. His act of caring, not just his emotion, but his act of caring for his people. Finally, the Israelites are reminded that on the night of the Exodus, God kept vigil. Have you ever kept vigil? Do you know what that means? Keep vigil it means you stay awake. I can remember one of our congregants who was at the end of life, read your hospital, coming to the end, and I would come, and sometimes there were other people, uh, but sometimes there was only one other person, and that was their spouse. 
And they were just sitting there in the corner, hour after hour, through the night, through the day. You know what they were doing? They were keeping vigil. They were honoring their loved one. That is a way of honoring your loved one. You, you stay up late, right? That's what they were doing. Hmm. And then the author tells us that from now on, so on Passover Eve, Passover Eve, future generations should honor God's past vigilance. Remember on Passover Eve, God was there. He was present. He was watching. He was guarding. And when the angel of death came and saw the blood of the lamb on the sides and the tops of the doorpost, he passed over. God was watching. God was preserving. God was protecting. And it's because of God's past vigilance, the author says, uh, that future generations are to do the same thing. And I, I did a little research on that this week, and best I could determine, that still is a Jewish practice. And I don't know if the you know, kids like it better than the older members of the family, but the idea is that you just stay up late. And you do that to honor God staying up late on the original Passover Eve. One of my mom's sayings, favorite sayings was, God is watching over us. My mom had a very simple faith. My mom would not have been able to answer difficult questions about the Christian faith. She was not an apologist. She couldn't really defend the Christian faith. She had a simple faith, but she had a good faith, a pure faith. And part of her faith had taught her through thick and thin to trust in the Lord, come what may. And she did that during good times and bad times and all the in-between times because she understood that God cares for his people. That's one of our anchor points. So these are the Exodus notes. They were told to leave. They left with dough, right? All kinds of dough. Their group went east. It was large and they had provisions and they were upheld by the Lord. Those are the Exodus notes. So this is part one of Israel's great escape. Come next week for part two. As we prepare ourselves for communion, uh, as I often do, I'd like to make a few remarks. And then as we partake, we'll pause after each of the elements and we'll remember him. Been asked if we would give a little more time to reflect. And so uh, we'll try to do that starting this week. As I was reading through these Exodus notes this week, I was reminded of Jesus' admonition to his disciples, not in a desert, but in a garden, the Garden of Gethsemane. When he asked his followers, Mark chapter 14, he asked his followers to keep vigil. Remember that? What, it, what, it, what was he going to go do while they were supposed to keep vigil? Yeah. I'm going to go pray, and I want you, it's just a small thing that I'm asking you to do. I want you to keep vigil. So Jesus actually didn't simply go and pray. He went and he agonized in prayer. I don't know if you've ever agonized in prayer, but our Lord did. And, of course, while he was agonizing in prayer, they fell asleep. And shortly thereafter, when a posse appeared to arrest our, arrest our Lord, you remember what the disciples did. They deserted him. I mean, you know, while we're piling on Judas for betraying the Lord... And Peter for denying the Lord. Let's not forget about the other disciples who were deserting our Lord. Instead of staying awake, the very thing that Jesus warned them against, what did he warn them against? He said, pray so that what? You don't fall into temptation. And they fell into temptation. What was the temptation they fell into? They fell into the temptation of self-preservation. 
Is there anything more tempting than that? To save your skin? The posse shows up, like they just do a vanishing act, right? They're preserving themselves. And I think the teaching for us in part is that we need to be a people who are vigilant. We need to be a people who know how to stay alert. Some of us are very good at that. During those dark times when evil seems so strong, we need to take it to the Lord in prayer and to be strong in the Lord. Well, this morning as we remember the Lord in the breaking of the bread and the drinking of the cup, we are assured that the Lord Jesus is keeping vigil. He's watching over us. During a pandemic, before a pandemic, after the pandemic, he is doing that for us. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we're amazed at the way you delivered your people in the Exodus. And we are equally amazed at how you've delivered us through the dying and rising of Jesus. And so today we remember him. We honor him for being the sacrifice for our sins. So let's take the bread, which is the reminder of his body, willingly offered for us. And let's remember him. And let's also take the cup, the reminder of the blood of Christ that was shed for the remission of our sins. If you'd like to go a little deeper in the message today, we're going to give you some questions. You'll find these in the Friday Roundup, and you can discuss them with someone. First question is in Exodus 12, 31 and 32. Why do you think Pharaoh finally released Israel and then even asked for a blessing? Then in verse 36, how is the Lord's supremacy put on display? God's really big about kind of showing himself to be